Uh, good morning. A couple of quick things I want to talk about that are, I think are important that we need to know about uh, that are good things for the church. This week uh, was VBS week. And if you've never been able to bring a kid to VBS or been able to serve at a VBS, uh, the best way to picture VBS is 80 to 100 kids in perfectly controlled chaos, right? Uh, But it was an amazing time. We had 80 plus kids that got to hear the gospel over and over and over again presented them. Uh, We even had a kid come to know the Lord. Uh, But there's a lot of work that goes into that, right? A lot of prayer, a lot of planning, a lot of last second planning. Uh, that's part of, of ministry, right? We, we, we set a plan, we are ready for the plan, and God says, hey, by the way, that wasn't my plan, here's my new one. And, and then we faithfully trust that God's in control of that. And so VBS was an incredible time. Over here, there's some God sightings. You can read some of the things the kids shared with their leaders. Uh, the kids raised almost $1,500 to help paint the school in Liberia, which is awesome. Uh, It was just a really, really incredible time to watch God work. So I want to thank you for all the support. If your support means that you regularly give to WCC, then you supported what we did. If you were praying for it or actively involved here, uh, it it was incredible. I mean, we had a shopkeeper that talked like Yoda. I it was amazing, right? Uh, it was just a really good time for our kids, uh, and so we are, we are thankful for that. The other thing is we are doing baptisms next week, and I don't want you to, like, hear that and just be like, oh, yeah, it's another, just a, it's another thing, right? How do we measure success of a church? We see people come to know the Lord, become disciples of Jesus, and we baptize them, right? We, that's, that's how we measure success. If we have 20,000 people in our church and no one is coming to know the Lord and we are not growing in our faith, we are failing. We're just a, another organization, right? We're a football stadium worshiping at the feet of football players. So this is an exciting thing. Uh, I believe, don't hold me to this because sometimes I remember numbers wrong. I believe we have confirmed and are having at the moment at least 11 baptisms. Yeah, it's exciting. God, God's doing everything. Now here's my challenge to you. Uh, we, I have a class today right after the service. Uh, we will meet, we will talk through. Uh, I, I know I have a couple people coming to the class. Uh, it's not very long. It's just a few minutes of explaining what baptism is. Uh, we have a kind of confirmation interview that you do with an elder or leader in the church to say, hey, we are certain of what you believe. Uh, because here's the thing, baptism is an act of obedience, right? So I want to lay a little challenge on your heart. Uh, if, you are, if you have come to know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you put your faith in his death and his resurrection, for the cleansing of your sins and life, and you have not got baptized since that has become true of your life. And I say that that way because I've technically been baptized twice. I was baptized as a, I don't know, very little baby, right? I didn't know the Lord. We, we call it believer's baptism because that's what we see in Scripture, a knowledge and a faith, and a belief, and a trust in Jesus, and then we get baptized. So if you haven't been baptized, I would encourage you to consider that. I I have enough testimonies right now that people are going to share next week that you don't have to talk. So don't be scared about it. This is a celebration. This is a symbolic moment where we declare to the church, to our family and friends, to whoever is there, 
that we believe that Jesus Christ died and I'm going to live for him. Right, so we encourage you to celebrate. Be excited. We're going to show up in our Hawaiian shirts. Good. Or dresses or whatever Hawaiian clothes you're wearing. Uh, if you come with a Hawaiian suit, somehow you win. All right, you win. Uh, but we're going to show up and we're going to celebrate and, and celebrate the goodness of God. We're going to hear testimonies of people within the church who have come to know the Lord and where they're walking with Jesus today. And, and we're going to celebrate what Christ has given us, a new life. And then afterwards, we're going to eat together. Do you know that's what the church did? All the time? They ate together. So we're going to, it might feel weird, right? You might be like, well, we're sitting out. This is not how church is. We're going to talk today about faith. And I want to challenge you to consider that what we do when we worship the Lord matters from this perspective, not from this perspective, right? And so going outside and, and sitting where it's hot and a bug's biting you, get, I get it, I hate it too, right? Like I, I must taste really good to bugs uh, because I am literally always devoured when I go outside. This is about the kingdom and the king. And so we, we want to celebrate this. We want to eat together. We want you to bring your yard games. If you don't have any, I'm going to bring redneck bowling. I will teach you how to do redneck bowling. All right? But this is, this is a celebration of what the Lord is doing. This is an act as his people to say, I am with the mission that Christ has given to us. So we want you to be part of that. If you say, well, I'd like to get baptized, but I can't, Guess what? We're doing several baptisms on August 4th, too, so you can join them. So just keep that in mind. Uh, and if you say, I can't make either one of those dates, guess what? There's always water available. We'll figure out a time, right? Uh, so let's pray again, and then we're going to dive into the end of chapter 4 of John. Uh, Heavenly Father, we, we have come before you again. We, we've had a beautiful opportunity to worship you this morning through, through fellowship, uh, through through song, through prayer. And now, Lord, we're going to dig into your word. And so, Father, I, I don't want my words to be heard, but your spirit. Uh, I don't want this to be about me or about us, but about you and, and what you're speaking to us. So, Father, would you, would you clear our hearts right now and our minds and all the things that we're thinking about or are anxious about or worried about or... or want you to deal with, would, God, would you help us to lay those aside? And that in this moment, for the next 30 minutes or so, that we could focus and hear clearly from you, uh, that you would speak to us on an individual level, on a church-wide level, that we would, we would hear from you and then we would move in your direction. And so, Father, we just thank you for your word, that you would talk to us and you would spend time with us and that you would lead and guide us. So, God, we just pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, how many of you, show of hands, this is the one time I'm going to let you show of hands. How many of you have faith? Good. Great. Lots of hands. How many of you can explain exactly what faith means? Maybe. Maybe. Yeah, that's okay. We're going to explain faith because our, our conversation, our, our scripture today is all about faith. And I, I want to make this clear. If you've ever heard C.S. Lewis teach, he always was very adamant about making sure that we understood the words we were saying because what happens in culture is words change meaning. Right? When I was growing up, we would have said cool. You're cool. This is cool. That's cool. Some of you, when you were growing up, that was probably jive. Right? Right? Now they're saying words like fresh, and I can't keep up with the way the language is. All of those mean the same thing. Right? All of those mean the same thing, but the problem is, is if we use them in context, one person hears one thing, another person hears another thing. And so when we think about faith, our mind might go to multiple directions. And so what we have to do, and what we constantly have to do as the church, is we just have to define it in not our own terms, but in God's terms. 
Because when we, when we come back to God as our barometer, we can understand where we're at and where we need to be. And so we, we look at Scripture to define faith. And there's a challenge there because it's all over the place. It's the same thing, but it's saying one thing and another. And all of those pieces are about faith. And so I'm going to kind of try to lay it down into one area. Hebrews 11.1. 1. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the convictions of things not seen. This is, this is the scriptural definition of faith. Hebrews 11.1. 1. So I'm going to, I want you to consider that. All right? Because faith is a combination of knowledge and trust. Knowledge and trust. And I, I think it's important that we understand that. Because I, when I was growing up, I went to church. And I am so thankful for that. I learned a lot of things. But what I did know was a knowledge about Jesus Christ. I grew up almost my entire life knowing factually that Jesus Christ was real, that he was God, that he died on the cross. I factually have believed that my entire life. I was not saved. I did not know Jesus as my Lord and Savior, even though I factually knew it to be true. See, there's a difference between intellectually knowing that this is a fact, right, and trusting that fact. Do I trust that Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sins? Do I trust that Jesus is God? Do I trust that His Death on the cross covered the cost of my sin. Do I trust that when Jesus rose from the dead, that it is a guaranteed promise that my death will be resurrection instead? That is faith. It's understanding and believing the fact and taking it to a point of trust. Because I'll be honest with you, there are some times in Scripture that we read something and we say, we don't understand this, that we just need to have faith that God has it in control. That we'll read something and we'll see a contradiction or we'll think through it and we'll go, we don't know how to deal with this. And what, we, what faith is is saying, okay, I trust Jesus. Like he's laying this fact out. I don't understand why it is the way it is, but I trust that this is Jesus. Now let me put it in a very practical way. All right, I want you to consider this. Every person on the face of this earth can define what a chair is. Can you describe a chair? If someone's like, explain a chair to me. Now you're a little confused because you're like, I've never thought about actually explaining what a chair is. Have you ever taught someone what a chair is? No, but we know what a chair is, right? It's a place where we can sit down. That's, that's head knowledge. Trust is I'm going to sit in this chair and it's going to hold me. All right, so we have this, we have this, we have this knowledge of Jesus, and we say, okay, the Bible, the Bible, you can read the Bible, I guarantee you're going to be transformed. But you can hear facts about Jesus, and go, yeah, that's probably true. Every major religion believes that Jesus was something special. The demons believe that Jesus is who He says He is. I want you to consider that. They factually know who Jesus is, but there's a trust that be, this, this is the definition of faith. We, we take our facts and our trust, and they get combined in this one thing, faith. Assurance of things hoped for, conviction of things not seen. But the question is, okay, we, we can define faith, but where does it come from? Like, is it some, like, muscle that we can lift and grow and, and make stronger? Is it something that we can just have? Like we could pick it up, we immediately start following Jesus and we have faith. Uh, Paul says this in Romans, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Okay, so where do we get faith? He, he later is having a conversation with Timothy in 2 Timothy, and he says, Timothy, you've grown up reading the scriptures, and the scriptures have made it possible for you to understand what salvation is, and because you're now saved, you now have faith. And so it's this working of God in us that God speaks faith into us. And if you continue to read 
what Paul and Peter write, it seems that faith is measured in individual people, meaning it is possible for the person next to you to have more faith than you do. And guess what? It's possible for you who may be of little faith who can gain more faith because the scriptures say that if we ask of Jesus, it will be given to us. And if we ask for more faith, God will give it to us. There are situations that we face in everyday life that we don't have faith in Jesus for. We factually believe that Jesus can move mountains, but I guarantee none of us are praying that it happens. And if we do pray, we're praying in a manner that says, I don't really know that Jesus can actually do this thing. So we're thinking about mountains and so, okay, let's go simpler. Man, I got a, I got a loved one that I've been praying for 30 years that they would come to know the Lord. And you got faith in that? Do you trust that the Holy Spirit is working on their lives and speaking conviction and truth to them? Faith is, is both pieces. of Factually, I know this is true, but I actually trust that Jesus is going to do these things. And so we, we have to understand that faith is produced by God through his word in us, and it can grow when we are praying for it and asking for it. It's a gift from God, Ephesians says. A gift. There is nothing you personally can do about your faith. God does it all. And he gives it freely as a gift. I want to encourage you, that's the greatest news ever. Like, when we constantly read in Scripture that we can't do it, we can't do it, we can't do it, there is something about our mentality, and I think it's an American mentality, I'll be honest with you. It's especially in American Midwest values. I can do it. I can fix that. I can make that better. I can take care of that. Those aren't bad attitudes. But when we translate that to our relationship with God, I'm struggling with this. I can fix that. This is really hard. I can fix that. Can you? How long have you been struggling with that? How much time have you sat in the word and in prayer and allowed God to handle that? Like we factually are like, no, but I know. I know this to be true. I know this is, I know this is a fact. I know that God says this. Do you know how many people over the course of the last like 30 years have told us when Jesus is going to return? Someone's wrong. And do you know those people are still doing it? Like, I'll be honest with you. There is a good note here, right? If, if someone says, hey, God's going to return this day, and he doesn't, guess what? That person doesn't know what they're talking about, right? So, so we, we, we can read Scripture, and we have to understand and trust that Jesus and the Holy Spirit are leading us to what is correct when we read Scripture. We have to read Scripture and trust that even if I don't personally like what Jesus is saying, that he knows better than we do. Because if we don't, if we just factually know that Jesus is Lord, and we factually know that he was real, guess what? Almost every historian on the face of this earth believes that Jesus Christ walked this earth. Every single one. It's not a debatable historical fact. The majority of historians in Jesus' time believe that Jesus rose from the dead. Now, they try to explain it in a bazillion different ways, but there is historical evidence outside of Scripture for Jesus' living, his death, and his resurrection. That's a fact, right? But if we don't trust that for our salvation, we just have knowledge. And if we don't trust that Jesus can do the things he does to transform our lives, our lives will never be transformed. And, and the reason we have to talk about it is because I think this story encapsulates this idea of knowledge without trust. And eventually, trust comes. Right? But I, I, I think we walk with Jesus and we, 
we read our Bibles and like we take one thing that we read and we're like, I, I know what I'm doing now. Now, this happens a lot to me in not in scripture reading, but like in a news article, like the first paragraph, I'm already done, right? Like I've read all the information you're going to give. The rest of it is just useless. Uh, I would recommend, to be honest with you, in the next four months, and I'm being dead serious about this. This is my encouragement as one of your elders. I, I'm going to speak for the elders on this for us. You okay with this? He's like, I'm not sure. <laughs> Okay, I'm just going to talk to one of your elders right now. For the next four months, Satan is going to attack every single one of you. And what he's going to do is he's going to put junk in your news feed that's going to make you want to be divisive within God's people. And you're going to see things and you're going to argue about, well, this is what our country needs and this is what our country needs. And you're going to, what happens in social media, and if you don't know this, is the more you search for something, it turns into an echo chamber. You just start hearing the voices of the same people that you like. And what happens is the more people to get together, the dumber they get. Tower of Babel. Why? Because they think they know best. And so they get together and their voices get louder and they get more intended. And what happens in the body of Christ is we, we begin to hear outside voices other than Jesus. And we begin to put our faith in something else. I promise you this, okay? Jesus is going to return as king and the United States of America is going to crumble like every other nation. Do I want that to happen? Yes and no. I, I say yes because I want Jesus to come back and I do want Jesus to reign as king. Do I want every nation to fall apart? No, but we have to. Death is the response of sin. It is the consequence of it, and only Jesus can save us from that. And so in the next several months, what's going to happen is Satan is going to go after you left and right. You, I would recommend not turning the news on at all. I'm serious. And if you want something, this is what I will do. I will have Aaron this week, in the weekly update, send you out a link. I only get have one news source. One. It's called the pour over. It's a Christian news site. They send me an email like four times a week. It doesn't say anything except for facts. This situation happened. Here are the facts. Here's something maybe you should consider praying about. I, I will have Aaron send out a link to that in the weekly update. And the reason I say this is because what happens is, is Satan can't, can't change you the facts in your mind, but he can convince you that there's a different way. And he can make you begin to trust in things that aren't Jesus. And what happens with that is we begin to see the scriptures as faulty. And we begin to hear the Holy Spirit wrong. And we begin to walk in a different way. And I think that's the case in the story of this man in, in John 4. If he, he has head knowledge of Jesus, but not trust in Jesus. And what's interesting about this passage is there seems to be two contradictions here. All right, so if you ever come across the contradiction in Scripture, uh, you're wrong. But I don't say that to be mean. I say that, like, write it down. Write it down and then either get someone to help you or begin to study that to explain why. And here, here's the contradiction. Verse 43, John chapter 4. I'm going to read through both contradictions. After the two days he departed from Galilee. Remember, he was in Samaria, and we're going to talk about that in a second. For Jesus himself testified that a prophet has no honor in his hometown. Where is he going? His hometown. So when he came to Galilee, the Galileans welcomed him. Contradiction. I thought Jesus, who himself said, I have no honor in my hometown. Having seen all that he had done in Jerusalem at the feast, for they too had gone to the feast. So he came again to Canaan and Galilee, where he had made the water and wine, and at Capernaum, where there was an official whose son was ill. When this man heard that Jesus had come from Judea to Galilee, he went to him and asked him to calm down and heal his son. Right? This, it looks like this guy has faith in Jesus. Right? He comes to Jesus for healing, but Jesus' answer to him is, unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. Contradiction. Wait, I thought this guy believed in what Jesus was doing. So we could read this, and this happens a lot in scholarship, is that we'll read something like this and wait, say, wait, John is contradicting himself. 
he, Jesus himself has said he has no honor in his hometown, yet he's going to his hometown and people are welcoming him. Now I want to teach you something. I dislike email and text messages. Not because I do, it's a great way to communicate. It makes things so much simpler. I cannot tell tone at all in either form. Like if I'm going to have a serious conversation, we're going to have a face-to-face so I can see your body language. So, so I can hear you speak. So I can feel that you can hear me speak because I'm not the best writer. If I need to write something, I give that to my wife. Right? If you see anything that's written by Pastor Stephen that looks really nice, my wife wrote that. All right? If you see it and it looks like a text message that you got from your teenager, that was probably me. Uh, now, why? We can't read tone. But we can read context. So just before Jesus heads to Galilee, he's with the Samaritans, right? And what are they doing? They're surrounding him, and they're spending time with him, and they're welcoming him. And what are they calling him? The Savior. This is the Messiah, the one who has come to save the world, right? And now he shows up in Galilee, and I think what's happening is John is being sarcastic. I think Jesus is sarcastic sometimes, too. And I think that's showing in John. And I think what he's saying is, yep, they welcomed him. And and the reason I I understand the context is because they show up to Jesus, right? This is not just Jesus walking along and there's one guy having a conversation. When Jesus travels, there's a group. And what Jesus says, he says, unless you, you is not singular, you is plural. There is a group that showed up with this official, and they wanted to see what Jesus could do. He had just spent days with the Samaritans who were supposed to be the unloved group, not God's people, the ones that chose to go a different route, and they called him the Messiah. And now he shows up to his own people, and they don't believe he can do anything. If you've ever seen the movie The Incredibles, uh, they're a superhero family, and there's there's a little neighbor kid that like sits across the street, and he kind of watches them throughout the movie. And one day, he's just sitting in the driveway, and the dad gets out of the car, and he has super strength, and he's just sitting there, and he's staring at the dad. And the dad's like, what do you want? He's like, I want to see something incredible. Like That's these people. They're showing up. They've heard of Jesus' things. They have a factual knowledge. Of Jesus. Okay? They, they, they were at the wedding or they were present at some of his other miracles and or they heard it from their neighbor and they're like, okay, I, I've heard this guy. I The history book said that this guy could do what he said he could do. But it, it is not faith. Like this official doesn't have faith in Jesus in this moment. What is actually happening is that he is at his last wit's end. His son is not ill in terms of like, hey, my kid's sick and he has a fever. He has pursued probably every single doctor that he could. He's tried every single medicine that he could. And what he has done, he says, I have heard of this man who has done miracles. And he shows up when he is traveling back and he stops him and he comes to him and he says, listen, could you heal my son? He's dying. He's at the end of his rope. He has no need for help. And and we are at a place where John makes it very clear that Jesus isn't actually welcomed here. Like he says that, but they challenge again, over and over again, are you sure? So you have this drastic juxtaposition of the Samaritan people who should be abandoned by God according to all the laws of the Jews, who found the Messiah. And then we have God's people who should be the most understanding of Jesus who have seen him grow up and raise. And I guarantee that Jesus did miracles throughout his life. We don't know, right? I can tell you what Jesus did when he was 24, 25, 26, 27. He made chairs. He's a good carpenter. That's literally all we know. He loved Jesus or he loved the father. He was honoring the father with whatever he was doing. And he made chairs. Or tables, or I don't know what carpenters make. But 
We don't know, but I guarantee that people were seeing Jesus' entire life as something different because he was perfect. And so in his own home area where he should be the most celebrated person possible, they don't see him and they question him every bit. Now, I want you to consider this because I think the people that we find closest to us are the hardest people to reach. Guess what? A prophet has no honor in his hometown is very realistic. It is extremely hard to, to guide and lead the people around us. It, why? Because they've seen how you were before Jesus. Which you would think should be a great story of like, look at, the, look at what Jesus did. Like I was this person. That's, that's what a testimony is. It's testifying to the changes that Christ has made in your life as you have put your faith in him. And so this man has a factual head knowledge that Jesus can heal his son, but he is at his wit's end and he doesn't know what else to do, so he's trying this. And what Jesus responds with, as I read this earlier, unless you, everyone there, see signs and wonders, you will not believe. How many of us are like that? How many of you trust Jesus in all of what he says? All right, you ready for this? I'm going to take you down a trail. Does Jesus install leaders? Oh, buddy, now we're going somewhere. Let's go political for a second. Do you trust Jesus installs leaders? You know what Jesus tells you to do for your political leaders? Pray. How many of us have gotten frustrated at our political leader instead of prayed for them? Stop and pray next time. Man, I listen. Our political leaders need Jesus. I need Jesus. Right? But there's a trust here, right, that says... All right, let's take it to the church. Does Jesus put in your leaders? Yeah. When you called me here, did God confirm that through a vote of the congregation? Yeah. The same thing is true of all the elders of WCC. Now, what does Jesus, the Word of God, say about your elders? That they're supposed to lead you and guide you and shepherd you, and you're supposed to pray for them. Right? Do you trust your elders? So if I like ask you to do something crazy that's very biblical, but it feels wonky because it's like, hey, we we've never done church this way. I've never in my life done it this way. And I like here, I'll I'll make you this promise because this is the conversation. Elders and I have been talking about it. We have had some great conversations. Your elders are looking for the future and saying, okay, God, what do you want us to do? And what we're hearing over and over again is we got to get back to this. And it's not, that we've, it's not that we've strayed away from God's teachings. It's not that we've gone away from what God has called us to do. It's that the church in Scripture looks awfully different than our church here. And that's not to say a bad thing, Right? Because because as the culture changes, we have to somewhat, we don't change our message, but it's okay to change our approach. But as the church, the people that are supposed to gather around and, and celebrate and minister together and gather together as Jesus' people to go and make disciples of all nations, well, that that should look like this. And it's not that we're doing anything bad. I want you to hear that. To be honest with you, I don't even know what the elders, we, we're talking about all kinds of things. We're not ready to say, hey, here's what we're going to do. But we're getting there. We're, we, God is laying some foundations for us as your elders to say, hey, here's what. And it might be something that you're like, oh, this is totally weird. right? But we, I just literally asked you if you trust Jesus. Jesus puts into place elders. He does it by calling through the people of the church. And now it's like, oh, well, I don't know if I trust my elders, which is understandable because right, we're... We're broken people too. We sin. And we mess up. And, and what we do as elders is we hold each other accountable. But, but then we change things. And you're like, oh, I can't believe that Pastor Stephen or 
Forrest is the only other elder here today. So, or Forrest did that to us. Ah, why did they make us do that? So this is, this is faith, right? Faith is understanding the factually things that God teaches us in Scripture and making them real in our life because we trust that Jesus knows best for us. And so it ta- it, it's a leap of faith, right? To, to, it's a leap of faith to wake up after every single election and th- trust that your country, and if it falls apart, guess what? It's faith to trust that God is present and active and working. And, and so there is a, there's a matter of trust, of faith here. That until Jesus makes this statement, I don't think this guy has. It looks like he does because he comes to Jesus. Lots of people come to Jesus. I come to Jesus sometimes and I pray and I realize that I don't actually think that God is going to do what I'm praying. And it's a good thing. It's a thing that God is laying on my heart and I don't trust him to do it. And that's hard. That is very, very hard. But I want you to see the response because I think the response of this official is good. He, he is a skeptic. He's heard facts. Verse 49, the official said to him, sir, come down before my child dies, right? Like he's still, he's still not there. But he factually knows that Jesus has done some incredible things, right? We factually know that. I guarantee you've experienced it in your own personal life. Jesus said to him, go, your son will live. Now, here's where the man switches from fact to trust. He doesn't debate Jesus. He doesn't argue with Jesus. Jesus, if you just showed up. Have you ever prayed that? Like, Jesus, if you just show up in my life, I, I could deal with this. Have you ever prayed that, Jesus, if you just show up and then a friend came into your life and they started telling you something about your life that you needed to address? And you're, and you're like, Jesus, if you just show up and Jesus is like, man, I just sent someone to talk to you. So he realizes at this point that he has taken the fact, and we see this, Watch, watch how this man reacts to all this. The man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and went on his way. As he was going down, his servants met him and told him that his son was recovering. Now, if you had someone sick in your life, what are the first questions you're going to ask? How are they? How the recovery look? What, how they feel them now? How, like, you start asking all these questions. This is not what this guy does. His questions seem very weird, but very faithful. So he asked them, the hour when he began to get better. And they said to him, yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. The father knew that was the hour when Jesus had said to him, your son will live. He knew. He knew at the moment Jesus said that, he knew the second he saw his servants that Jesus had healed his son right then and there. His factual knowledge of Jesus was transformed into trust. The father knew that was the hour when Jesus had said to him, your son will live. And he himself believed, right? This is the best part. He believed in what he'd do in all his household. So you know what this guy did? Scripture doesn't tell us. He did the exact same thing the Samaritan woman did. He met Jesus. He factually knew things about him, and he came to the realization that he had to trust in Jesus Christ. The Bible says that we faith is the ability to trust Jesus in salvation. He trusted Jesus in the salvation of his child. And, 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 and so when he realizes this, he comes to an understanding that this Jesus is, is not just facts. He's real and I trust him. And so what does he do? He shares that with his family. 
he shares that with his family and his entire household comes to faith in Jesus Christ. Parents, this matters. Your faith and trust in Jesus is impacted on your children. How they see you, the way you talk, the way you treat them, the way you trust Jesus, your faith will impart on them and you can show them Jesus over and over and over again. It can become from a fact to a reality because what's true, I guarantee it, is that if you have always raised your kids in a Christian home, you have taught them lots and lots of facts. Good. How do we show them how to trust Jesus? We show them how we trust Jesus. We have to trust that Jesus knows better than the when we read something in Scripture that we realize that this is a sin in our life, we have to trust that Jesus knows the process to walk us out of that sin for restoration. And guess what? He does. He lays those things out in Scripture for us. He, he lays out what sin is. He lays out the things that are bad for us. He lays out the way we should treat one another. He weighs out the way we do things. And let me give you a list. Let me find my list. Hold on. It's long. Jesus tells us to do many things. Are you ready? <clears throat> Probably need some water after this. Hold on, I gotta get it on the full page. <clears throat> oh no, I can't. Sorry, we're just gonna do it this way. All right, repent, rejoice, let our light shine. Be righteous, be reconciled. Settle matters quickly. Keep your keep your word. Turn the other cheek. Go the extra mile. Love our enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Be perfect. Forgive fast. Don't worry. Seek His kingdom first. Watch out for false teachers. Pray. For workers, be shrewd, hear God's voice, be a house of prayer. Go to those who sin against you. Be a servant, make disciples, keep his commands, deny yourself, be ready. Pray, go, be a servant, make disciples, deny yourself, be ready. Do we trust Jesus that we can do those things? He, he, he knows that we can't, but through him we can and this is a tiny list of the things that Jesus calls us to go and do. He wants you because he loves you. And when he is allowed to, to work in your life, there is transformation that happens and our faith begins to grow to unimaginable levels. Not because of anything we do, but because the trust we have in the work that Jesus does. If, and this is the struggle I have in my entire life, if I feel like there's something that should be happening and I'm praying before God. I, what I realize is I'm the problem. It's not necessarily that I didn't pray enough or pray hard enough. It's not necessarily that I wasn't spending in Scripture. It was that I didn't trust. I didn't trust that Jesus knew better than me. So I was praying for the wrong thing. And when the answer showed up, I didn't like it, so I was frustrated. Do we trust? Do we have faith that God will heal? And do we have faith that if God chooses not to? Do we have faith that God can lay all these things out for his people and ask us to do those things, that doing those things will be the best thing in our lives? I want you to try this the next time you're in an argument with someone. It's going to freak them out. So do this. It'll be great. Stop in the middle of it and just say, hey, let's pray. I do this when, I, when I'm in counseling and I like don't, I'm like lost for where to go because I'm not a professional counselor. But I'll say, hey, we got to stop and pray and allow the Spirit to speak. Right? It because we don't we don't know where to go, but we we factually know where Jesus will lead us. Right? We can read we can read over and over again his promises. But if we start reading scripture with the faith that the way God speaks in his word, we will move, not because of some works. Works are a product of our faith. Right? Our salvation comes and then we're able to do the things that God has called us to do. And so we, we can pray. We, we struggle with who Jesus is, not because we don't know the facts, 
but because we're uncertain of whether or not we trust that. And so I think what happens, uh, I show this to our kids, and I, I, uh, we, I got to share the gospel with the kids on Thursday of EBS, and I drew a picture for them. And in the picture, there is uh, the earth, and it's broken. And, on, and what happens is, is that people, people go after things that are not of God. Right? They don't go pursue God. They go pursue whatever they can feel. They, they put their faith in all kinds of things. The jobs, health, the government, family, friends. They put their faith in it. And so, and so inside of a broken world, and what this picture looks like is, is they're like bungee cords. Right? They, they, they run away from God pursuing this thing. They put their faith in it. And what happens when you stretch a bungee cord to its max. Have you ever seen those like uh, inflatable obstacle course things where you attach two bungee cords and you try to race to the wall? What happens is the person that actually gets there the fastest just rockets back. If we pursue things in a broken world that are not of God, when we whip back, where do we whip back to? The broken world. We put our faith, our trust, our hope in something that was not Jesus. And when we pursue it, it whips us back into this brokenness and we're like angry all over again. So we try to pursue it with something different. Drugs, alcohol, relationships. I'm going to put a hard one on you. Ready? Service. Sometimes we hide our faith in Jesus by, look how well I serve. Now Jesus is there, sit down with him. And so we have to take our faith from a head knowledge to a complete and utter trust. And we only do that by spending time going before the Lord and asking for more faith. Hey, God, there is a situation in my life right now that your scripture clearly says that you're in charge of. I need the faith to trust you in this moment. We got to get out of the mentality of we can fix it. We're not Bob the Builder, right? And we definitely not Jesus. But I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is the way. He is the truth. He is the one that gives life. And so when this official says, okay, I trust. I am trusting Jesus for the life of my son. What happens? Yeah, son gets healed. Side note. He gets saved. So what happens when a group of 300 people take their head knowledge to trust knowledge and put those things together? And they change the way they're doing the community of God, not because they want to be cool, right? We're not putting smoke machines on the stage. It ain't happening. Uh, we're, we're not getting into some crazy, we're not doing some crazy trend. Or I'm not going to be do some funny thing up here. We're going to go back to Scripture. We're going to sit there. We're going to pray, not just as your elders, but as the church as a whole. And we're saying, okay, God, what... We want to make sure we're doing this right. And at times that may be just trying different things. That may be asking you to do things out of your comfort zone, right? If the elders come to you and say, hey, we really think the best thing going forward in the future is having these really tiny pockets of discipleship groups where you have to sit in and you have to meet with other people of the same gender as you and you have to study scripture together and you have to hear the scripture and you have to process that together and you have to share things in your life together. And guess what? You might have to actually lead that group at some point. How many of you are like, ah, no, no, no. Like, if I if if I said, hey, I want you to go and find someone, I want you to share. Here's a brother in Christ. Here's a brother in Christ. Could you share with one another your struggles with life? And your our immediate reaction is like, I don't want to do that. But what if we did? Because we trusted Jesus and not ourselves. 
What if we did that because we took our factual knowledge of Jesus and made it our faith? Through the Holy Spirit allowing us to see the truth of salvation. Then, people will be healed. Not necessarily of physical ailments, but of the spiritual death that comes from sin. So I ask you again, do you have faith? I hope the answer is yes. So what are we going to, as a church, trust Jesus for today, tomorrow, in the next five years? Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Uh, we thank you for your calling on our heart. Uh, we are thankful for that the Jesus willingly came to earth to give his life so that our sins would be placed upon him. And that in doing that, Lord, he took all those who believed their sins and, and offered up life through him and life abundant. And Lord, in, in dying, he rose from the dead, conquering death, meaning that death has no hold, no sting. And so, Father, we want to take that from a factual, we know that, to being a trust, that that is going to change us. God, I saw a lot of heads nodding. you got a church here full of people that have faith, that, that want to just see Jesus move and see Jesus proclaimed and see Jesus known. And so I'm just, as an elder of WCC, on behalf of the elders, we just open our arms up, Lord, and say, whatever you want us to do for the kingdom, we'll go do it. We, your leaders, we, your church, we, your people. Spirit, overtake our hearts and our brokenness and our fears and our anxiety and our, our worry and replace that with the ability to trust in God and his word and in his truth. Trusting that that will change us, Lord, and we can move with that. And so, Lord, we just, we pray for faith like that. Faith beyond just our salvation, but faith that we not just believe that you can move mountains, but we stand by and watch as you do it. And we celebrate and we keep praying for you to move more. And so, Lord, we just thank you for this church and all the people that you've gathered here to be part of what you're doing. So, Lord, just help us do it. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Faith is given to us by the word of God to, to believe in salvation. I want to read this to you. It's, it's what Jesus does for us. Now, in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside his control. At present, we do not see everything in subjection to him, but we see him for who, for a little while, we made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting that he for whom and by whom all things exist in bringing many sons to glory should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. Now it goes on and it says, and again, I will put my trust in him. Jesus Christ has died on the cross for your salvation. And the Holy Spirit wants to speak to you and offer you the truth of that in your heart, that it becomes not just a factual knowledge thing, but a trust thing. That I guarantee, not because of me, but because of what Jesus says in his word, that if you put your trust in Jesus Christ on the cross, in his resurrection, in the repentance of your sins, that God will forgive you and you will live with him for all of eternity. In that, I trust. And so, Father, we pray that that trust becomes the sounding cry of our church. That that's how we walk as a family. I will put my trust in him, Christ alone. We pray all these things in his holy name. Amen.